Center and um, a program today. Joanne will do an introduction in a few minutes. Um, I'm Ellen Premack. I'm the chair of Friends of Folk Art this year. And Friends of Folk Art is a wonderful organization that helps support the Museum of International Folk Art in, here in Santa Fe. And if you'd like to be a member, we'd love to have you as a member because we do lectures, programs, trips, and we are doing a trip to Oaxaca, um, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. Um, if you would like to be a member, you can go to a website and just Google Museums of New Mexico Foundation. And that site should tell you how to join to become a member of Friends of Folk Art. Or you may send uh, me an email, Ellen, and my email is e premac, P-R-E-M-A-C-K, at gmail.com. And Joanne will send out um, the email if you look under your chat box. And I'd be glad to talk to you more in detail. Um, I just want to give a big push for Sunday, February 28th at three o'clock, our next lecture is Chocolate in Colonial New Mexico. Um, that is going to also be a February program, February 28th. And um, if you are interested in joining that, we will actually be doing chocolate tasting and it's a hands-on workshop. But don't be shy if you don't live in Santa Fe because you can buy a ticket just for the lecture. But if you're in Santa Fe, you can buy a ticket for the chocolate tasting and the lecture. And that's Sunday, February 28th. However, we need you to register soon. So get in touch with us soon. The big news is um, our Oaxaca trip which um, fingers crossed that COVID is controllable and we'll be able to go. Um, the dates of that trip are November 29th to December 7th of this year. Um, we are going to have seven days and eight nights in Oaxaca. And this tour is presented with the help of Joy McAfee and Judith Hayden. Um, it'll be filled with museums, trips to artist studios, cooking, culinary experiences, cultural centers, and um, it's very reasonably priced so that 18 people can join in. Um, so if you aren't receiving our emails, look for my email and we'll make sure you get info on both of these upcoming events. Right now, I want to introduce Joanne Ward, who will introduce David and Frank, our speakers today. Thank you. Unmute, Joanne. Here we go. Sorry about that. I don't know how I got muted. Um, so welcome back. Um, this is the second time some of you will be hearing this introduction. Um, and a first time for several. So I'm going to do the whole thing again. Um, we're lucky today to have two guests sharing their knowledge and love of the graphic arts of Oaxaca. Our first speaker is Dr. David Farmer, who joins us from his home in Taos. Dr. Farmer is the author of 10 books and numerous published articles. He was raised on his family's ranch near Fort McCavitt in the Texas Hill Country, where his mother taught him at home before he left for high school in St. Louis. David is lectured widely here and abroad while holding academic posts at the University of Texas in Austin and later at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. 
He developed and taught courses in English literature, Southwestern authors, and the artists and writers colonies of Santa Fe and Taos. His biography, Stanley Marcus, A Life with Books, was published in 1993. His biography of Willard Clark, a depression era printmaker beloved by many New Mexicans, won a major award from the Texas Institute of Letters. In 2015, David curated Pressing Through Time, 150 years of printmaking in Taos, a multi-venue set of exhibitions featuring 630 prints related to the long history of printmaking in the Taos Valley. David's lecture this afternoon is drawn from his 2019 trip to meet Oaxaca printmakers. Following Dr. Farmer, we'll hear from Frank Rose, a Santa Fe resident and owner of the H.O. Mono Gallery on Canyon Road. Frank will join us on screen after a short video about H.O. Mono and its relationship to some of Oaxaca's premier graphic artists. Frank describes himself as a creative conductor. He is passionate about facilitating support for artists and orchestrating events and experiences that cultivate community, beauty, and wonder. He holds a degree in digital media and has exhibited in the US, China, and South Korea. Frank founded Gallery 1724, a community art space in Houston, served as press coordinator for PhotoFest, the largest photography festival in the US, and was the publisher of Arts Houston Magazine before moving to Santa Fe in 2008. Frank co-founded Form and Concept in 2016, and he opened HO and Mono in 2019. Um, we welcome them both, and we thank them for supporting today's Friends of Folk Art program. Let's get started. Um, but first, our Zoom controller is Friends of Folk Art board member Ginger Williams. Ginger will connect us now with Dr. Farmer, then to Frank. She'll be monitoring our chat room and she'll help with your questions, which we'll respond to after both David Farmer and Frank speak. Thank you. Go ahead, Ginger. David, if you want to share your screen. Okay. Let roll. Okay, let her roll. Here we go. Woo. Hey, how about that? How about that? So, well, let's, I'll just take it from the top. <laughs> In September of 2019, um, six of us spent two weeks in Oaxaca visiting printmaking studios, print collectives, meeting artists, seeing their work, going to museums where prints are celebrated in prominent, beautiful, well-lighted spaces. We toured remarkable print collections, including the one formed by Mexico's legendary artist, Francisco Toledo. And we were shown carpetas, the portfolios of prints that are produced with great artistry and loving attention to detail. And these have multiple, multiple prints in handmade clamshell boxes. They tempt your collecting instincts right away. And we met some of the dedicated and talented printmakers at work in Oaxaca Valley. Doors opened to an amazing world of artful purpose. And the Latin word came to life, communitas, the root of the word community. It reveals something we found in Oaxaca, an intense, spirit of life and art, and a commitment to social equality, solidarity, and togetherness. It's hard to imagine how the spirit of Communitas binds a valley where over 90 presses are at work. But it doesn't stop there. It moves across the country, over the borders, and nothing like this has happened on such a scale anywhere else that prints are made. And that naturally poses a question. What set this phenomena going? 
Why Oaxaca? What in the history of Mexico laid the groundwork for such a flowering of printmaking? And what brings these artists together and inspires them to make prints, to risk their freedom with political action in art, and to produce art that captures the spirit of a country in remarkable images that are shown in museums around the world? David? And how did this spirit, yes, Ginger? That little box is showing up. Do you and want to switch to my um, my presentation? Sure. Let's see if that'll do it. Okay. We're, we are on slide. We are on image number six. Okay. Shall I? Shall I withdraw from? Let's see if I can get. Okay. My. I think I saw your, let's see, there they are, the two women consulting on a print over a work table. Okay. The one right after. There you go. So you just let me know when you want to advance. Okay, let's go to them. There they are. Okay, and then Let's go to the next print because that opens the, the, what I'm going to say about how we answer these questions. Uh, so the next, the next slide. There we are. Uh, what, this is a 16th century print of, of uh, a representation of Mexico City. And the reason printmaking started in Mexico is that printing with printing presses started. And when you've got a printing press, you have not only type, but you have illustrations. So let's go to the next slide. We'll see another early illustration. Okay, this, this, is a, this is an early engraving, again, 16th century. And then let's go to the one following this. It's of a printing shop in Mexico City. And this is, this is the scene where printing and printmaking really got started uh, in, in this hemisphere. And it carried all the way through to the Mexican Revolution. It fed directly into traditions of printmaking. Let's go to the next one. Traditions of, of printmaking that drew upon photography and, and printing. And the next slide. Some of the best known photographers of the revolution worked for a man named Augustin Victor Casasola and took photographs like this and the next one of a woman standing on the steps of a rail car as it pulls to a stop. This is one of the most iconic and famous images of the revolution. And this image leads to the next one, which is a print that we're gonna see a recent print made in Oaxaca by Mario Guzman. This, this tradition of printing and printmaking really came to life during the Mexican Revolution. And the father in the next slide, we're gonna see the father of Mexican printmaking in the early 20th century was an imposing figure deeply familiar with the photographs like the ones we just saw. This was Jose Guadalupe Posada. He lived from 1851 to 1913. And in the next slide, we're gonna see an image of him. That's, that's a contemporary, a 20th cent, 21st century image and standing at his shoulder is a calavera, 
uh, which he made very popular. Let's go to the next slide and we'll see some of the brightly colored uh, broadsides that Posada made with calaveras. The calavera is an image and a metaphor deeply embedded in the Mexican psyche because of the belief that with every step one takes through life, and let's go to the next slide, every step one takes through life, death is walking quietly beside us. This isn't morbid, it's not a macabre notion, it's just the way things are. So our Mexican friends can make jokes about death and employ the calavera as a commentary on life. We'll see more in the next slide. Gives lessons on what happens, these images, these broadsides. It provides a great way of coping with the difficulties in life because it had total permission, like King Lear's fool, to speak truth to power. As one historian noted, Posada's prints became something of a benchmark for artists who appreciated their immediacy. They were easy and cheap to print. They could reach wide audiences. And in Mexico, prints were effective for creating a visual language that everyone could understand and enjoy. And in the next, in the, let's go to the next slide. In the early 20th century, there, the examples of these prints had a profound, a profound impact on artists who, in response to the turbulent political climate and social unrest, they were eager to reach broad audiences. And another way that art in Mexico did after the revolution is in the great murals. Diego Rivera and many fe fellow artists recognized what Posada contributed to the imagery of Mexican life and beliefs, and they carried his motifs into their art. And after the Civil War ended, there was an explosion of artistic forms and schools promoted in part by the government framing the story of Mexico as a nation emerging from a rich and complex past with indigenous roots. These grand frescoes, let's, let's take a look at the next one. Yes, the grand frescoes were painted in huge public spaces by notable artists like Rivera, Orozco, Siqueiros, and Jean Charlot, among others. And it wasn't long before American artists were traveling to Mexico to learn from the muralists what was happening down there. In the next slide, the vibrancy and the momentum of artistic movements after the revolution led to the formation of the Taller de Grafica Popular, the People's Graphic Workshop an artist's print collective founded in 1937 by artists Leopoldo Mendez, Pablo O'Higgins, and Luis Arenal. These, in the next slide, these founders of the TGP concentrated on printmaking and especially showed workers. This is, this is a lithograph by, um, by Pablo O'Higgins and they featured workers Along with this tradition was a collaborative approach, in the next slide, collaborative approach to making art in Mexico that's also found in US printmaking communities in the borderlands, as well as in cities today like Los Angeles and San Francisco with vibrant Hispanic communities. These traditions are clearly front and center in Oaxaca at this very time. Let's take another, um, the next slide. We find it shown in museums and galleries, art pasted up on walls, stenciled on doors and other surfaces, handed out in the street, all produced in a variety of printmaking techniques and all living alongside fine prints made and shown around the world. 
Let's take a look at the next one. This is by Leopoldo Mendez, and it's one of his most famous images. It's called Homage uh, to Posada. He made this in 1956. And uh, we see Posada sitting at his, at his work table in the print shop because his, his assistants are behind him setting type. There's a type case behind the three men and uh, looking out the window at police beating people who are, who are demonstrating in the, in the street. Uh, it, this is a magnificent print. Let's, let's go to the next one. Another major influence on the printmaking scene in Oaxaca comes from one of its native sons, Rufino Tamayo, born in 1899 of Zapotec heritage. For a time he worked in Mexico City, along with Los Tres Grandes, Rivera, Orozco, and Siqueiros. But he became disenchanted with political art and moved to New York and then to Paris. De Mayo's reputation grew rapidly. Let's look at the next one. For remarkable paintings and complex, beautiful prints. Like this, he returned to Mexico more interested in making prints and developing a new technique for doing so in three dimension textured images. He called his new printmaking process mixographia and it's still being used today in only one place, a studio in Los Angeles that he helped establish where prints like his Dos Personajes Atacados por Perros, the, the two people being attacked by dogs. The, it's a huge lithograph, it's 60 by 97 inches and the stone for that print measures I told you the measurement. It weighs 1,800 1, pounds. Let's go to the next one and we'll see. We'll see him standing beside this stone. Yeah, you, as, you, as you might see, the image is reversed from the one that we saw two slides back that was in full color. But this is the stone itself. And of course, the image that comes off of it is the reverse of what you see on the surface of the stone. And here he is standing beside this, this remarkable work um, on, this is limestone. Um, in addition, let's go to the next slide. In addition to making great art, Tamayo gave back to Oaxaca in many ways, gifting a home filled with pre-Columbian treasures to the city of Oaxaca, founding the School of Art, El Taler de Artes Plasticas Rufino Tamayo, the TRT, 47 years ago. And now there are generations of Oaxaca printmakers who have studied art at TRT. And that's where this man, Shinzaburo Takeda has taught. He came over 50 years ago. He was a young Japanese expat. He's now 86, elegant, revered figure in town. He's known as El Maestro, a master of printmaking and a master teacher. Let's go to the next slide. Although retired, he still attends gallery openings and participates in discussions about printmaking while generations of his students are still creating notable art. And in the next slide, our backstory is going to close with three recent forces shaping the vibrancy of graphic arts in Oaxaca. Two artists and a brutal political clash in the streets of the city. One of those artists was Rodolfo Morales, a quiet man whose prints, whose all of his work is, is recognized for its incredible beauty. You will recognize the bold colors and the celebration of life. Let's go to the next slide. Where strong women hold villages in their upraised hands. And I'll just pause on this one before we go to the next one. This is Rodolfo with, um, with the director on the left, the director of the, of the Mexican Museum in Austin, Texas, 
and then on the right, Nancy Mayagaitia, who had who who formed the uh, the finest and the and the first contemporary art gallery in Oaxaca. Um, and let's go to the next slide. And we'll see his, yes, Rodolfo Morales, those, those gorgeous paintings with the women always there, always the force holding things together. <clears throat> and then in the next slide, there's another artist in, in this back. Oh, one more. <laughs> yes, the dogs. Yeah, she, he loved showing dog. He had a number of dogs that, that were part of his life at his home and studio. And here again, the women uh, 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 imposing presence on the landscape. And then in the next one, we're going to see another artist who was uh, a great influence on Oaxaca art and a giant among creative people in our time. This was Francisco Toledo. Toledo was born in 1940, and he studied at the Escuela de Bellas Artes de Oaxaca and later in Paris. And at the age of 19, his, let's go to the next slide, his solo show at age 19 in Fort Worth launched a meteoric career that took him to the Venice Biennale, the Whitechapel Gallery in London, the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, and many other great art venues around the world. Let's see another one of his works. Next slide. Yeah. The cow with spilt milk. And then the next one. monkey drinking ink. He, he just tossed these things off almost endlessly, uh, day in, day out. Uh, there, is a, there is a catalog raisonne of his artwork that is in the, the volumes. Each volume is about four inches thick. And there are five of those volumes that represent the catalog raisonne of Francisco Toledo's work. And let's go to the next one after this. All right. He founded organizations that are among the most significant players on the cultural scene today. He established an art library at the Instituto de Artes Gráficas de Oaxaca. This is Iago, and this is the building that, that is there today holding, in the next slide we'll see, the most comprehensive book collection on graphic arts under one roof in all of Mexico. Then he set up the Eduardo Mata Sound Recording Library, also at Iago. And this room, by the way, is only one of a half a dozen. And then and here we see here we see another of his great projects, the the um, museum. Of, um, this is uh, just a minute. This oh, this is the center for the arts, Casa, which is about fifteen miles out of town, um, at an old factory which he restored. And in the next slide, we'll see uh, some of the exhibition space that he created there for art. And there are the, the art exhibitions out there are free uh, and open to the public, along with free musical concerts on the weekends and a cinema club with free cultural films. And in the next slide, we'll see some of the work paper that comes out of the paper mill that he established in a hydroelectric facility that's just below the, the, the huge gallery, new gallery space there. You can tour that and you can find handmade papers, which he made and he did the art on these. This obviously, this is the a kite. And he used to, let's go to the next slide. He used to fly these kites in protests against violence and political stupidity. 
And yes, he made, let's look at a couple of more slides. Uh, he made remarkable art in many different mediums continuously. And at the time of his death, he was recognized as the greatest artist in Mexico, whose spirit of creativity, activism, and benefaction set the tone for much of what happens. But a moment ago, I mentioned that there was political unrest that influences what happens in the arts today. And that, was, that came to a head in 2006. Oaxaca has long been the scene of political struggles between the teachers and the state. It came to head in a brutal way in the summer 2006 with the government breaking up teacher strike, the teacher strike and trying to neutralize the resistance. The APPO, which was one of the artists groups, controlled part of the city and it went back and forth between them, but there were deaths uh, cars and buses were burned, uh, tear gas was hurled one way and then another, and the protesters, some of them were beaten and jailed, others killed. And this led in part to some of the art that goes up on the walls, even to this day. Uh, and it's based uh, on traditional imagery. It's based on woodcuts and, and lino cuts as a medium. And, and these are wheat paste block. These are put up on the wall with, with wheat paste. They're block prints, essentially. And uh, if artists were found during those, those times in 2006, um, if artists were found protesting art and posting protest art in the middle of the night, uh, they were uh, sometimes they were beaten and arrested, held in jail for weeks. It's a somber spirit of a time that lives on in some of the art today. Spontaneous po posting of political art still takes place, but the city now recognizes they will not be able to stop the street art. And they have designated, let's go to the next slide, some neighborhoods where uh, less political art and, and more artistic murals are, are put up on walls. And one more. Yes, there. Um, there are maps, and we're going to come back to this one in a little while. That, that is a representation of Macedonio Alcala. And I'll tell you, a musician who wrote who, who also wrote music. And I'll tell you in just a little bit how he figures in this story. But there are maps and articles about street art. You can find it on the, uh, on the internet. There are bicycle rentals that offer tours of street art neighborhoods. And you can see work like this, which is really quite beautiful. Well, with these backstories in mind, let us now look at some of what is happening in Oaxaca and graphic arts studios today, where artists young and old are indeed printing the future while honoring the past. What I have time to tell you, it reflects only part of a huge movement. Let's, let's go back to that one just before, uh, uh, back to uh, only part of a huge movement with over 90 presses at work. It would take, I think, a year's residency to research and write the full story. So Oaxaca is clearly a place with a deeply ingrained sense of communitas. And this is a good example, this little folded paper. It's called the Pasaporte Grafico, Oaxaca. And it, it is the result of 12 graphic art talers, studios, that offer open house on the same day and evening each month. And in each of the participating locations, a visitor can pick up what they call this little pasaporte grafico with a folding map that locates the 12 galleries and workshops. And let's go to the next one. It, it shows how inside it has, uh, it has a little text about each of the galleries, where they are located. And if you go on that, that one day a month, 
and you buy something at each of these galleries, uh, you then get a discount on a print uh, at the at the at the end of your of, of your tour. So let's go to the next one. <clears throat> Participation in the Passaporte Grafico each month also generates additional interest in exhibit openings at other times. We discovered this one evening when the Taller Bureau Press, and let's go to the next one, <clears throat> opened a new invitational show of prints from Latin America. Um, it was an, uh, they called it the Concurso Latino Americano de Mini Print Oaxaca 2019. Entries for the Taller Bureau Press were kept small in format, as you can see here. And in the next slide, you can see the kind of press that they would be printed on. Um, so they could A, be affordable, and B, they could be sent from various countries in Latin America up to Oaxaca for this show. And let's go to the next slide. When we arrived the evening of the opening, it was an amazing scene. It had just opened a few minutes before we got there and the gallery was full. And, and so people were waiting out on the street where the taquitos were being served and there was a buzz of excitement that was unmistakable. It was, it was only with great effort, and let's go to the next slide, that the brave and stout-hearted uh, gallery goer could make their way to the back of the, of the uh, gallery and see more prints, but also have the opportunity to try the refreshments, including the mezcal. Uh, and I, we must say right now that mezcal is a very important aspect of the art world. And many of these, uh, many of these artists and galleries make their own. And we found that when we visited, this the gallery and Daniel Flores, who is standing there with his former student, Mercedes Lopez. And she is now a well-known artist with an impressive career. This is in the neighborhood where uh, this, the name of the, of, the, uh, of the gallery and studio is Grafica Zanate. And it's in the Barrio de Jalatlaco. Uh, Mercedes has been a driving force to create more space for women in Oaxaca's visual arts community. And she shares generously her knowledge and experience with students in workshops at home and abroad. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Short, and this is the print that, this is one of her prints. And this was juried in to a major exhibition in Seattle that she helped organize and other Oaxaca artists uh, involved in. It was Más Allá de las Fronteras, Intercambio Oaxaca Seattle, Beyond Borders, Oaxaca Seattle Exchange. And this is, this is uh, Mercedes print. And let's go to the next one. Shortly after we met her, she was about to, she was going to board a plane to go back to Oaxaca for a symposium that ended that exhibit. She would be one of the principal speakers up there. This is by this, uh, this is by Daniel Flores. This, this is, these are both intaglio prints. And uh, this, this is a powerful one. I, uh, it, the use of the Mercator lines, the idea of a map. Uh, the figures that are standing uh, in the lower foreground and the symbol for no parking um, that you see in Mexico uh, makes a very powerful statement about people not being able to cross a border or to go to another country. Well, before, let's go to the next one. Before bidding farewell to Mercedes and Dan uh, Danielle, they showed us a grand carpeta, 
And let's go a couple of more slides. You can see the size of these prints. They're vivid. And this is part of a portfolio. And this is, this is a wonderful homage to the to printmaking because it, it plays with an element of the rower, which is an important uh, piece of what happens in printmaking in inking a plate. Um, and then in the next one, yes, our hosts then poured some mezcal from their private reserve. These are indeed artists with good taste. And so let's go to the next. A number of print ateliers and galleries are located on the Calle Porfirio Diaz, which led from the house that we rented down to the central part of Oaxaca. And of special interest was Oja Santa Taler. This is a workshop dedicated to the exhibition, production, circulation of graphic art by women. And the, and the portfolio, the carpeta that was, that was available when we were there is the one that is framed and up on the wall. These, these are images by the artists in the women artists in that gallery of, of plants with medicinal and food value. And it was a beautiful suite of prints. Uh, let's go to the next one. These are some of the see, these are some of the principal figures in this gallery. It hasn't been easy for women to find a place at the table among among Mexican artists. That's changing, particularly in the print community in Oaxaca, thanks to notable advocates such as Mercedes Lopez at Grafica Zanate and teachers like Shinzaburo Takeda and empresarios like Francisco Toledo. The founders of Oja Santa Taler are accomplished. They, their work is chosen for exhibits in Oaxaca and Mexico City. We can see in the next, in the next slide, um, I think there's a poster for um, a major show that took place in, in Oaxaca, Zacatecas, and also in Mexico City by these women. Their mission also includes, let's go to the next one, art education for young students. And there are several evenings a week when they, when the doors are open and the students can come in and work with these, these remarkable artists. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> the next day we stopped by La Machina Taler de Grafica, established by Francisco Limon, with a lifelong interest in fine art lithography after learning his craft in Paris and in Mexico City. This press, <laughs> this is a 1910 uh, press made in, in Paris. And the name of the press is Voiran. And the stones for the next print, we were hoping that they would be ready uh, for this press to run. Um, but it, you can see the stone locked up in the bed of the press. This is a lithography stone, about three, three inches thick and weighing uh, several hundred pounds, but it wasn't quite ready to be inked. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the people who work uh, with uh, Limon uh, have been trained in the art of lithography. Some of them went with him to Paris to learn how to work with the stones and also to maintain this enormous press in, in fine working condition. And uh, they selected lithographic stones to ship back with the press. Um, and uh, there they are used. They are used there now. Let's go to the next one. Out in the uh, in the front room um, at La Machina, uh, there is a, a 19th century lithography press. That's just a work of art in itself. It you it takes smaller stones, um, but it and it still works. They they use it to print. They use it to print uh, lithographs on. But they also invited us to go back 
behind the scenes. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there we are, that, that stack of drawers holds the prints that they have produced at this, at this workshop. And um, both on the Voiran Press and, and the others. And we were invited behind the scenes, let's take a look, look at the next one, to see prints uh, that, they had, that they had printed. We were, we were welcomed by Emilia Tulia, La Machina's chief sales representative, who pulled out uh, print after print from these drawers, uh, including some by uh, an artist uh, whom we would later meet, Guillermo Olguin. We wanted to see more. Let's go to the next one. Here, here we are at lunch afterwards. We wanted to see more of Guillermo's work. So we, we, we offered to take Nancy Mayagoitia and pick her brain. Uh, so she helped us, the, she's the second from the right. And uh, she knows literally everybody on the art scene and they respect her role and hard work representing great artists from Morales and Toledo to many, many others. And one phone call later, after lunch, the door to Guillermo's remarkable compound opened as soon as we knocked. Let's go to the next slide. And as you walked into this house, you passed these marvelous workstations where different kinds, and he is a multi-talented artist, uh, that where he would work with pen and ink or, or with watercolor or with oil or with prints. And, and he's, he's just amazing. At six foot seven, Guillermo looks like he, let's go to the next slide. He just stepped off a movie set. Well, he's not in the movies. He's firmly planted in the world of art that takes him from Mexico, to Paris, to England, and then back home through the United States. And then as we walked around, we saw his library across the compound with bookshelves rising uh, behind glass. And his home and his compound reveal what magic can lie behind an ordinary door in a town in Mexico. We walked past these stations and then finally made our way back to a table. Let's go to the next slide. To a table in front of the outdoor cocina where Carol, my wife and I couldn't, let's, let's see, oh, there we go. Let's go back to the, to the print that just came up oh, after that. Here we go. There it is. We couldn't resist this print. It is, it, the title of it is La Matanza. And it's a print that started with Guillermo's visit to La Mixteca where entire villages make their living, raising and slaughtering goats, skinning them out, selling the meat, uh, preparing the, tie, uh, the, the hides for tanning, and we see on this line, the goat skins that are drying, but this is a technologically complex print that started with a photograph and moved on to an intaglio and dry point. And let's go to the next slide. With one look, we sensed a dialogue between Guillermo's print and a photograph by one of Mexico's great photographers, Graciela Iturbide who spent much time in the early 1990s documenting the goat slaughtering. And that's what this woman is doing. She's just used the knife. She doesn't need it right for that moment because she's pulling some of the skin off the, off the goat. So clenches it in her teeth. Um, it's, it's just a remark to see this, this dialogue going between a photograph by a famous Mexican photographer, Graciela, and, and Guillermo's print 
is what adds richness to the whole to the whole process of looking at art. Now let's go one more slide. Here's here we are at the table out uh, near his outdoor cocina, uh, where we said our farewells uh, with a print on the table. Frank Purcell, who who is standing in front of the of the print on the table, that's the print he bought. Uh, and it's it's a crow wearing shoes, and you. I wish I had a I wish I had a picture of that. But uh, after our farewells, uh, Guillermo walked us to the front and gave us a bottle of his of his uh, mezcal that uh, is it's pretty wonderful. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> After we said our farewells to Guillermo, Nancy took us to meet Abram Torres, a master printer and founder of the Taller Grafica Bamboo. Abram and I had already been communicating through email, but for our visit, Nancy kindly came to help us as a super adept translator who grew up on both sides of the border and caught all the nuances. Let's go to the next slide of what Abram was saying about the carpetas he showed us. And here is one with strong and fierce artistic statements protesting violence against women. After we looked, let's, let's do one more. After we looked at prints and presses, yeah. And you can see, let, I'll just pause, see that the, the beautiful hand, handmade box there that the prints are in, and then the cover inside the cover of the box, uh, there is a there is an index to the prints that make up the suite. Um, so, uh, after we looked at prints and presses, Abram and his wife, a professional nurse, brought out fresh apples and nuts and cheese and mezcal, and we sat by one of his presses and talked about approaches to printing and learned why there is an almost palpable feeling of peacefulness in his studio. For Abram, the art of the print is like a journey, perhaps a pilgrimage. In his studio, wherever a plate or stone, whenever a plate or stone is finished, inked and ready to print, Abram rings several little temple bells from Tibet just before turning the wheel to move the plate through the press. He observes this peaceful ritual with his own prints, as well as those his students make. As Abram Torres spoke, I looked up on the shelf behind him to see a little Buddha figure and knew we were in the presence of an artist who draws from traditions that reach beyond his Mexico. His image is Puro Mexico, but more than one country is needed to encompass his heart and mind. This helped explain his many acts of generosity that include weekends with his Taler Bambulante. It's a press on wheels that he takes to parks to teach children printmaking. It was a privilege to spend time with this remarkable printmaker and enlightened human being. At the end of the visit, I gave him the tamarind book on lithography with more than a little trepidation that he might already have it. It turned out he did not. The only copy of the book at that time was in Oaxaca, was in the non-circulating library at Iago. Now he can re reach up on the shelf and take it down. Perhaps it's been up there resting beside the little Buddha. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> On the following weekend, we stopped by the Jardín La Bastidad on Calle de Macedonio Alcalá, where Abram had just finished several hours of printmaking with children. And you can see the little press that's over on the table. Let's go one more slide. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, and the little press on the table, uh, work that's been done that day, a, a student still drawing in his in his notebook, um, and it 
it's just a remarkable scene to think about every weekend uh, is going down there and teaching children to print. Well, let's go to the next slide. Near the end of our magical fortnight in Oaxaca, we, while walking down Calle Porfirio Diaz, we stopped in Espacio Zapata Arte Popular, where we met the artist whose street name is Yesca, and who has said, the street is the most beautiful gallery I can have. The wall outside the front door tells us about this cooperative where some members of ASARO, the ASARO, the Asamblea de Artistas Revolucionarios de Oaxaca, they produce some of the hard hitting protest art we're seeing around town. The central figure of Zapata is iconic and ubiquitous throughout Mexico. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> the artists here often collaborate on political art with several pre, uh, contributing to the creation of one large block print. These artists do not sign their name to their collaborative work that is posted on walls around the city, but it's hard hitting. Let's see the next one. It's hard hitting and they don't, they don't blink. This is, I don't want to go to school because you will disappear. Uh, and the next one, <clears throat> they don't hesitate to let people know what they think of you know who. Um, and then the next one, This is some of their work that was on the walls outside in the streets uh, that we found on some of our walks. And then we go to the next slide. You can see how this is, um, this is uh, not linoleum, but another, another material uh, that's not expensive that you can carve and get the same effect of a block print, either on wood or linoleum or in this, in this particular medium. Uh, and here it is coming, the, the, uh, the plate is, he's just lifted it off of the paper that he printed on. Let's go to the next one. <coughs> In another room, um, we came across th this image. Um, the, the banner that's coming off of the, the little whirligig that keeps him aloft, uh, fascism um, travels the world. Um, this is about 12 and a half feet long. And you can see the armband with the swastika on it. Uh, there's a torch in his right hand and his left hand is holding a bomb. The, the, the print that's hanging on the wall covers that up. Um, but I, um, it's, this art has come to the attention of a number of institutions. Princeton has begun collecting uh, the art that they make at this particular studio and that shows up in the streets. And UNM has started a digital archive um, uh, of this work. And um, we, when I saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, is there another one that, that they could, that they have on file? And I talked with Jeska and I asked him and he said, no, we don't, but I can make one for you. I'll print it, I'll print it tomorrow night and bring it over to your, to, to your house. And so he did. Uh, he and his girlfriend came up with this package and this 12 and a half foot long print uh, and uh, driving their motorcycle, he handed it to me and we included it in a show up here in Taos just before, uh, the, uh, just before the pandemic closed everything down. Well, let's go to the next slide. And we're going to find ourselves in the, in the studio of Enrique Flores. We've visited Enrique a number of times in, in past years, and we wanted, to, we wanted to go back. He is regarded by many 
as the finest printer in Oaxaca today. I'm not going to take time to talk about the, the role of the printer and the, and, the, and the making of the print, but if we want any questions afterwards, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but he has he prints for others. And this, his studio is in, in Huitzo, in the Mixteca region, and it's always a special treat to see. Uh, this is the town where he was born in 1963 and where he has built a remarkable studio. Let's go to the next slide. Filled with light and a large intaglio press and also this lithography press. I, I asked him where, where he got this. He said, I couldn't find one to buy. He said, so I built it. <laughs> he went to the books, some of the books at Iago in the, in the print library and found the drawings that he needed. And so he made sketches and, and recorded the dimensions and he came back and he built his own lithography press. His reputation as an artist is international. He's had more than 100 gallery exhibitions from Mexico to Holland to Japan, United States and beyond. Let's, let's go to the next one. Enrique showed us some of the marble stones that he is using now for lithographs. You can see uh, standing on their edge uh, just beyond him, those are the traditional limestone stones um, used for lithography, but they are very rare, they're difficult to find, and so artists in Mexico, and Enrique is helping lead the way with this, are learning how to uh, print, how to, how to use the surface of marble for a lithograph. Let's go to the next one. You can see these stones don't have the grain that the traditional, the, the traditional a lithographic stone has. They, they have this beautiful texturing of marble. Let's go to the next one. And you can see they're almost in a way translucent. Uh, the light shines through them and it's a very difficult surface to draw on, but he has figured it out. And um, let's go on to the next couple of slides. He was showing us some of the large intaglio prints and while we were there, we were very lucky. Let's go to the next. We were very lucky that here's, here's one of his that was not finished yet, uh, but, uh, and I wished it had been because it, a copy of it might have followed us home. Oh, uh, let's go to the next. We were very fortunate because his assistants, they're very well-trained printers themselves. Uh, we're getting ready to print a plate. You can see the copper plate in the bed of the press. The image is on it. It has been inked. It has been placed very carefully within the, within the little corner marks. So it's lined up, registered. And the woman in the polka dot blouse standing at the tray back there is just about to take out a sheet of paper that has been dampened by the water. She'll place it on the table to her left, blot it just a little bit, and then it goes down on the inked plate and very carefully uh, registered within those corner marks. Okay, now keep in mind, the plate is over to the left of the press. Now in the next slide, we're gonna see it having come under the roller and they pull back the paper from the plate, you can see the color that has gone on. This is called a drop. And there are two more that are gonna happen. Uh, let's look at the next one. It, it, they, they inked some more with blue and there it is. And then in the next one, we're going to see the finished print. It's, it's just remarkable to be able to, to, be able to, to uh, witness this, this beautiful work coming off the press. Let's go to the next slide because we're, gonna, we're going to do something different here. When I asked Nancy uh, before our trip if Iago would like a gift of books about prints and printmaking, she called the new director, Hazam Hara Chavez. He's on the left in the blue shirt. He told her they would welcome books. Carol, my wife, had been encouraging me to just sort of get some of these things off the shelf here. And so I packed up a, a good number of books to give to them. 
And the, he introduced us to his curator of the Toledo collection. That's Gerardo Martinez standing next to me. It was an occasion we were all looking forward to and the response to the books we brought was enthusiastic. And let's go to the next one. After we said our farewell to Senor Chavez, Gerardo Martinez took us to the archives building not far away to see some of the print collection that Francisco Toledo had been forming over decades. It's, it's a facility that's a little cramped, uh, just like many archives I've visited and some that I've worked in. But Gerardo took our minds off of that when he began setting prints on the table, starting with prints by Albrecht Durer and moving up through time. Let's go to the next one, including some, uh, some prints by Francisco Toledo himself. Um, and then just when you think you've seen it all, and he was bringing out some remarkable work, let's go to the next one. He, he put this on the table and took the tissue off the top of it. This, this, is, by, this is by Leopoldo Mendez. It's a, it's a long, long uh, lino cut uh, with multiple sections that tell a story. We had never, some of us who've been following, following Mexican prints for a long time and, and, and looking at them in books and going to exhibitions and collecting some of them, we'd never seen this. It, it was a triptych that was unlike any other. And it wasn't in Mexico City, it was in Oaxaca, in an archive lovingly shaped by the greatest artist in Mexico of our lifetime. Well, after that, one needs some decompression time. So the next morning on a walk, it was, it was early. We rounded a corner and we didn't need a newspaper <clears throat> to learn what had happened following our visit to the Iago and the print archives. Let's show a little close up of this. A stenciled image on a wall told us Francisco Toledo had died. The visual message was stenciled during the night by Yesca, whom we had met several days before, one of the street artists. It had the dates. 1940, 2019, and this wonderful imaginary uh, head, headgear, um, uh, which is sort of a symbol of power, really. And then the, the name, literally, of a song, Dios Nunca Muere, God Never Dies. And it was, we didn't learn about his death from TV or radio or iPhone. It was a stenciled print on a wall. It had many layers of meaning for Oaxacans, not only honoring Toledo's life and death, but because of a waltz by the same title written in the 19th century in 1868 by a Oaxaca native son, Macedonio Alcala. And I said, we were gonna come back to that wall mural in just a little bit while well, that comes up next, because this is across the street from the mural. And what is happening here is that song title, Yesca applied to Toledo. Dios nunca muere, God never dies. It is, it is a de facto anthem of the state of Oaxaca. Every school child has sung it. Every Oaxaqueño knows it. Its title was a fitting tribute to a great artist. And the newspapers in Mexico that day ran large headlines, among which my favorite was, Todos los colores se visten de negro. Francisco Toledo, el gran, gran pintor mexicano, ha muerto. All of the colors are dressed in black. Francisco Toledo, the great, great Mexican painter, has died. Let's go to the next one. Later that day, the floral tributes began filling the corridors inside Iago. And this is just one little corner of the passageways inside the building. And they were filled with wreaths like this. And then they had to start putting them out in this out beside the building on the sidewalk. Let's go to there. Yeah, they stretched from, from the doorway 
all the way down behind me where where I was standing. Um, and, and throughout the afternoon and the evening, people filed in to stand or sit and sign the book. I took my turn, let's go, yes. I took my turn after sundown and sat looking at the flickering candles, the personal notes in Spanish and in Zapotec, some ears of corn, <clears throat> a little mezcal near a portrait of El Maestro. Let's go to the next one. All surrounded by banks of flowers. After signing the book, I sat for a while and then walked out, turned the corner and Let's go to the next one. Yeah, I turned the corner and there was this window. You can see the screen there. There was this window opening back into the building in one of those rooms, one of those library rooms. And there sat the children studying in the library that a great artist founded and nurtured and that was open late the day following his death. The scene through the window linked right back to our early morning discovery of the stencil on the wall and the tribute it represented, it linked back to all the printmakers we met over our time in Oaxaca, every one of whom was nurtured, taught, and mentored by another artist. <clears throat> what I saw through that window resonated with the true meaning of communitas. Let's go to the next slide and that'll be the last. The true meaning of communitas and what it means to give back to the place one lives. Through that window, I saw the future and it looked promising. Dios nunca muere. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> That was fabulous, David. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. interesting to hear you talk about Francisco Solevo. His son, Benjamin, was a good friend of my grandson. And uh, he actually came to Denton and stayed with us oh. for, uh, <laughs> for quite a while. And then uh, they had a, the boys had a good time. There was another boy there too. You know. And I wrote out, if you're still there. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't remember who the other one was. Was it Boa or was it Jesse? Um, Jesse, Jesse, Susanna Trillian's son, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, Benjamin and, and um, Nathan, who's my grandson, and Jesse. Anyway, they all stayed with us for a few days. And uh, it was fun to get to know them. And, uh, and I think... The next time I went to Oaxaca, uh, I actually went to Toledo's home and briefly met him. So, oh, wonderful! I never met him. <laughs> I saw him some years ago while we were down there, and he was walking. He was walking toward toward the the uh, Iago and in deep conversation with a, a young artist that, and I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I'd love to have met him. <laughs> no, I didn't really just visit with him. I just, you know, oh, you know. <laughs> but um, that's interesting. Isn't that interesting, Aurora? Yeah, he was a wonderful artist, but I can tell you he was a wonderful dad because uh, Maestro Toledo, um, Benjamin is ben, Benjamin is 26. Yeah. So I cannot imagine, you know, how old he was when Benjamin and my son and some other kids were running wild in his house and oh, Maestro yeah. Toledo watching them. <laughs> <laughs> he was so patient. I mean, <laughs> you know, and I think the boys, uh, I can't remember if it was that group or another one, but they wanted to go down to the square and uh, uh, La Plata here in Denton. And uh, I think Don took them down there, but he said they had to walk home. So that was quite a walk for them. And I was really worried, you know, and I <laughs> stayed up late, you know, watching out the window. And when I saw them coming down the hill, I thought, oh, thank goodness, you know, I'm going to bed now. <laughs> so, 
These stories are wonderful and rich. They add to the presentation, but I'd like to um, go ahead and do part two of the presentation with uh, Frank Rose from Echoamano. Um, welcome, Frank and Ginger. Do you want to move us into part two? Yep. Frank, do you want me to just go ahead and pray, play the video and you can talk afterward? Sounds good. All right. Here goes. Or you can talk for a second while I bring it up, whichever. <laughs> uh, my wonderful wife, Kara, spent a lot of time putting this together. So thank you, Kara. This oh. was a great presentation that we just had, too. And I'm mean, looking forward to this one. But Aurora, did you recognize places in Oaxaca? Well, many of the artists, uh, I mean, <laughs> I know Guillermo Guin also. He um, what what you really what you showed is is very true there's just a real energy around printmaking um in Oaxaca right now and of course in the past but um that was one of the things that really impressed upon me and led to that being a real cornerstone of what i wanted to share uh with with Itchua Mana with the gallery here um i opened in march uh, uh two years ago 2019 um, and uh, decided to focus on uh, Mexican printmaking um, because, I mean, I was inspired by it, but I also just was recognizing how, how little exposure um, there was to Mexican printmaking in the U.S., um, in galleries in particular, and in Santa Fe in particular. Um, so, you know, before, you know, going there a few times before I even knew I was, I was st starting a gallery, I had really come to fall in love with the place and, and with, the, with the art there. Um, so when it came time to kind of do my own thing, um, I knew that the Mexican printmaking was gonna be a real part of it. Um, I work with uh, contemporary and historical artists from Mexico, um, as artists from Borough Press and Oja Santa, which you shared in your uh, presentation show with me here. Um, as well as some artists from Mexico City and Guanajuato. Um, I also show historical work by Tamayo, Francisco Toledo, uh, Carlos Merida. Um, and then coming up uh, at the end of this month, uh, I'll be doing a show of Jose Guadalupe Posada pieces. Ah, uh, good. Which is also in conjunction with the Posada show at the um, Albuquerque Museum. So two Posada shows going on right now or soon. Um, <laughs> And then I'm open uh, Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to five. Uh, you can, my whole inventory is online. You can see everything I carry at echoamano.org. Um, and just in case you're planning a visit down, I will we'll be closed on uh, February 17th and 18th, but otherwise I'm here Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to five at the top of Canyon Road, um, right across from the tea house. So really uh, happy to share that with y'all and um, thanks for being here. Space at 830 Canyon Road is small but grand in spirit. The room is full of light thanks to generous banks of street-facing windows and skylights. The over 100-year-old vigas and pine floors bring in an earthy warmth to keep the gallery rooted. Though you cannot find a straight line on the thick adobe walls, their Santa Fe charm is in keeping with the style of the space. This is the canvas on which the bright colors and textures of prints, ceramics, and jewelry get to show off their personalities. The building at 830 Canyon has been in the same family for generations, and at different times serving as a residence, convenience store, and printmaking studio. The work of Alberto Cruz focuses on childhood and innocence. His line is pure and simple. From his lucid and mysterious narratives, each piece tells a world of possibilities. 
His primary imagery is children's illustration in which Alberto Cruz finds a personal language to create his work. Eduardo Robledo is based out of Mexico City and creates mythic images utilizing the stories of past and present Mexico. Calaveras, animals, and humans play into this shared space through finely wrought lino cuts. Gabriela Morak is a Zapotec artist based in Oaxaca, whose primary medium is linocut prints. Her work focuses on images and figures from Zapotec stories and pre-Hispanic sculpture. These figures could represent the ancestors, who at the same time personify gods. Gabriela's imagery is bold and powerful, tapping into stories about our origins and creation itself. Ainite Silvestre works at El Pinche Grabador, a printmaking workshop in Guanajuato. The artist says, My work is connected to my ancestral roots, where the gods walk with the sun and goddesses blossom from the damp earth. Polvo Press is the work of Muriel Fraga and Alfonso Barrera. Polvo is a multidisciplinary publishing project that brings together printed publications in screen printing, lithography, offset, rhizography, and letterpress. All editions are limited, independent, and made in Oaxaca. a silk screen on paper bag piece by Taryn Laskin. Taryn is a local artist. He's um, Scott Pikani or Blackfoot, originally from Montana. We've had a couple solo shows with Taryn, uh, who utilizes very bright silk screen graphic colors, um, exploring a lot of the forms from his culture and uh, printing them uh, in primarily silk screen works. Kat Kinnick is a painter, ceramicist, and printmaker based in Cerrillos, New Mexico. Illustrating wildlife and wilderness of the high desert of New Mexico, Kinnick works to inspire a culture of fondness and connectedness to nature. She's inspired by the magic and inexplicable qualities of childhood and is drawn towards expressing playfulness and curiosity with a folk art aesthetic. Her work is a celebration of a unique ecology in New Mexico and its abundant diversity. Petro Mano also shows work by historical Mexican printmakers such as Carlos Merida. Um, Carlos Merida uh, did a lot of portfolios exploring the dress styles of different states in Mexico. Uh, this is a piece that was created in 1945. Echo Amano is handmade. In an increasingly automated world, we believe it is important to uphold processes that are humanity's collective inheritance. Works made by hand reveal the mark of the maker and express an incalculable heritage that we as people are gifted. 
When we hold a ceramic pot, we are not just holding a handmade object, but the entire history of craftsmanship that has led to creation of that vessel. Thank you, Frank. So this would be a good time for people to raise their hands if they have a question or comment and um, Ginger will open up your mic for you. I actually can only, un I can only request that people will unmute. So if people have a question and wanna unmute then go ahead. But there's been lots of um, compliments in the chat, David, about uh, thank you so much uh, for such a rich and informative lecture. Um, and I will be sure to include um, information about Frank's store and the recording and information about the Albuquerque Museum show. And um, if relevant, I'm happy to include Aurora's um, family's b, b in the email as well. I know it's come up in both of the talks. So uh, please feel free um, to get in touch with me. Um, if there's anything that else that should be in the email. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for joining us on this Sunday afternoon. Oh, Joan has a question. Go ahead. There are three questions. Oh. Dr. Farmer, did he uh, know of Mr. Remba in the Mixographia workshop in Mexico City? I think that's the gallery that he, his, uh, maybe it was a daughter or a niece ran in, in uh, Los Angeles. I've only visited, I don't, I haven't visited the facility in Mexico City, uh, only the one in LA and, uh, and I have, unfortunately, I didn't meet the, the principals that were involved in that. It's a fascinating process and uh, a major contribution to, to uh, printmaking techniques and very difficult. Yeah, I was in Mexico City and was there many years ago and bought a few things in the Hollywood. I think they were in Hollywood, if I remember correctly. But your presentation was wonderful. I enjoyed it very, very much. And Thank I you. knew about Toledo too. And, uh, of course, uh, Tamaya. There is a, um, a question from Barbara Hadley saying, what was the gallery in LA that was mentioned earlier that carries Mexican prints? The Mexographia. That's... Um... The mixographia. You you can it'll be on it'll be on the uh, you can do a Google search and it'll be on the internet. Um, Ellen asks, what was Avram's last name? Torres. Did did you get that? Avram Torres. Mm -hmm. And then I saw someone else raising their hand. Aurora, go ahead and unmute yourself first. Um, I have a question because uh, we do have a collection of several of his aqua tints. Um, I didn't see any work from Fernando Oliveira and uh, also Juan Alcázar. I know it is, <laughs> you know, to do something in 40 or 45 minutes. It's just not possible to cover. And, and that is such an incredibly rich uh, artistic scene in Oaxaca. Yeah. And if you just limit it to graphic arts alone, 90 presses are in that valley. And, 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 and you know, maybe Fernando what? Oliveira recently passed away. Oh, I didn't, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just no, I, it's, not, it's not to ignore others of talent. It's just how do we how do we tell a story and and without it getting too you know, stretched out in time. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, well, it was a great presentation. I I enjoy everything. It was amazing. Thank you. So I want to go back and finish my my work because it it will if I could have a month. I think I could meet, I would hope, um, uh, almost all of the printmakers at work. 
And uh, that's what I'd love to do. <laughs> <laughs> it was really interesting. And I didn't know anything about printmaking until this presentation, really. But uh, it was very interesting. Well, one of the lovely things about printmaking is that it allows, because these are multiples, but they are multiples, they're not run off on a, you know, like a Xerox machine. Uh, they are multiples that are produced either by the artist themselves or in conjunction with very highly skilled assistants. And so there is a limit in terms of the addition. It might be five, it might be 10, it might be 50, uh, but they are all vetted by the artist and signed and dated. And, uh, and so, but they're more affordable because they are in multiples and, and people can have, have the opportunity to hang something on their wall that is an original work uh, without having to pay what it costs for uh, a, a large painting. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you so much. It was brilliant. Oh, it Such was an right. awakening. Right. Right. I loved it. I